Hello and welcome to this online lecture on chest injuries hosted by Paramedical Services. The contents of this lecture involve the anatomy of the thorax, the physiology involving ventilation and respiration, different types of thoracic fractures, different types of pneumothoraces, and how to manage each of those conditions, including the needle decompression in a tension pneumothorax. In conclusion, we will discuss some of the cardiac injuries that can occur as a result of trauma. Having a look at the anatomy of the thorax, we're going to start by looking at the skeleton or the bone structure that makes up the thorax. In the most anterior portion of the body in the midline, we have the sternum. The sternum is divided into three sections, the manubrium, which at the most superior point we have the sternal notch where the clavicles articulate with the sternum. We have the angle of Louis, which separates the manubrium from the body of the sternum. This angle landmarks the position of the second pair of ribs. Extending down from the angle of Louis or the sternal angle, we have the body of the sternum. And then at the most inferior portion of the body of the sternum, we have the xiphoid process, or which is also called the ziphy sternum. We have 12 pairs of ribs, 10 of which are attached to the sternum via cartilages. And then we have two pairs of floating ribs, which is pair 11 and 12. All these ribs articulate with the thoracic spine, which we have 12 thoracic vertebrae. The thoracic spine, the ribs and the sternum all together encompass the thoracic cavity. We then have additional bones that are attached onto the thorax, which include the clavicle, which articulates with the top of the manubrium, which extends and articulates with the scapula. All the bones of the thorax are absolutely vital for the process of ventilation to occur. We rely on the muscles and the bones working together to allow for expansion and recoil of the thoracic cavity, which creates the pressure changes necessary for ventilation to occur. There are several muscles that are involved in the process of ventilation. One of the most important of these is the diaphragm. We can see from the cross section in the diagram here that the diaphragm extends from roughly about the 11th and 12th rib right up in a dome shape to the superior portion of the xiphoid process. During the process of ventilation, in inspiration when we breathe in, this diaphragm muscle contracts and as it contracts it pulls downwards extending the thoracic cavity inferiorly. Other muscles involved in normal ventilations are our intercostal muscles. These intercostal muscles, when activated during inspiration, will contract and they lift the rib cage superiorly and also extend it out laterally. So overall, we have a movement of the chest superiorly, laterally, and the diaphragm extending inferiorly to dramatically increase that intrathoracic volume. During any circumstance when the body requires more oxygen or requires to be blowing off more carbon dioxide due to the increased metabolic demands, the respiratory system can engage accessory muscles of ventilation. These accessory muscles include the sternocleidomastoid muscles extending from the top of the sternum, the manubrium, first rib and the clavicles and they help to lift the thoracic cavity up even more so than during normal ventilations. The pectoral muscles can also aid and further expansion of the thoracic cavity laterally and superiorly. And the body can also engage other muscles such as the internal intercostal muscles, the rectus abdominal muscles and the oblique muscles during forced expiration. And these all aid in helping the body increase the tidal volume and respiratory rate during times when there is more work involved in breathing. When we take a deeper look now inside the thoracic wall, we have a very specialized double membrane that surrounds each lung and connects onto the inside of the thoracic wall. This double membrane is called the pleura. And because it has a double membrane, there's a layer between the pleura that is filled with a serous fluid called the pleural cavity. The serous fluid inside the pleural cavity helps these two membranes stick together 
and it also aids in easy movement and gliding of the membranes over one another during the process of ventilation. The outer layer of the pleura is called the parietal pleura and that pleura is stuck onto the inside of the thoracic cavity and then also attaches onto the diaphragm. So during the process of ventilation, when the thoracic cavity moves out and the diaphragm moves down, so the pleura moves with the thoracic wall. And because of the serous fluid in between the pleural cavity and the visceral pleura attached onto the lung tissue itself, so the lung can actually expand with the thoracic wall during ventilation. We are heavily reliant on the pleural membranes attaching into the thoracic wall to pull the lung and expand the lung volume out during ventilation and also result in a recoil during exhalation. This is another diagram depicting the pleura surrounding the lung. The visceral pleura, which is attached onto the lung surface or lung tissues, is in a deep purple color and this doubles back on itself to form the parietal pleura, which then attaches onto the inside of the thoracic wall. Due to the situation of the heart and the lungs and where these two major systems meet one another, the thoracic cavity has many large or great vessels in it. And most of these blood vessels are usually under high pressure, particularly all the arteries in the thoracic cavity. Some of the major arteries inside the thoracic cavity include the aorta, which is exiting the heart, delivering oxygenated blood to the other great vessels of the thorax, and that's under high pressure. The aorta ascends and then descends down through the diaphragm into the abdomen. Extending superiorly from the aorta, we have the subclavian arteries running under each of the clavicles. We have the carotid arteries delivering oxygen and nutrients to the head. And then running inferiorly under every single rib is an artery delivering oxygen and nutrients to the intercostal muscles. The major veins to be aware of in the thoracic cavity include the internal and external jugular veins returning blood from the head, the subclavian veins returning blood from the upper limbs, into the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava running from the abdomen and lower limbs returning blood back to the heart, and then we have the intercostal veins bringing deoxygenated blood from the intercostal muscles back to the heart. This is just a closer look at those intercostal muscles and how they're vascularized. So underneath every single rib running inferiorly we have an intercostal vein, an intercostal artery, and an intercostal nerve. This is also a great diagram just to show you the different layers of the thoracic wall. Outermost layer is the skin, and as we move deeper, we get to the muscular layers and muscular wall, the bones of the thorax, the internal muscles, the parietal pleura attached directly onto that thoracic wall, the pleural cavity with the serous fluid in it, and then the visceral pleura, which is attached directly onto the lung tissue. Then wedged between the left and the right lung, we have the mediastinum, the mediastinal cavity, which involves the heart and the great vessels previously discussed. Just to note over here, as we have the pleural membrane surrounding the lungs, so we have the pericardium, which is a membrane or a sac which surrounds and protects the heart and anchors that into the thorax. Now that we've had a look at the anatomy of the thorax, we're going to discuss the physiology of ventilation and respiration. Mechanical ventilation is the process of moving air into and out of the lungs. So this is inspiration and expiration. It's controlled primarily by the autonomic nervous system. Generally, this is an automatic function of the body to breathe. However, we do have a degree of conscious control over our breathing if required. The process of mechanical ventilation and respiration supplies the body and the system with oxygen necessary for cellular respiration, and it helps to rid the body of metabolic waste such as carbon dioxide. 
This process of being able to rid the body of carbon dioxide helps to maintain chemical pH balance and homeostasis to keep the body functioning within normal ranges. And this whole process is highly regulated by chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata or medulla and peripheral chemoreceptors in the aortic and carotid bodies. These chemoreceptors are very sensitive and detect any changes in oxygen, carbon dioxide levels or pH levels around the body and initiate changes in respiration and ventilation to ensure we maintain chemical homeostasis and balance. For ventilation to be effective, all of the following need to be intact and functioning. The chemoreceptors and respiratory center within the brain need to be working and functioning appropriately. The skeletal structure needs to be intact and functioning as per normal. The muscles involving the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm and the accessory muscles of ventilation. The pleura surrounding the lungs and connecting into the thoracic wall, which all together are involved in resulting in changes in interthoracic pressure and air moving in and out of the body. During the relaxed stage of ventilation, where there's no air movement in or out of the chest, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles are all relaxed and the diaphragm is extended up into the thoracic cavity in a dome shape. The system is at rest. Then in order for ventilation to be initiated, a signal is sent from the brain down the spinal cord via the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm in the intercostal muscles to initiate a contraction. When the diaphragm contracts, it moves downwards and the intercostal muscles contracting lifts the thoracic cavity outwards and upwards. With the movement of, of the thoracic wall, there is also movement of the pleural membranes and thus movement of the lung. This is what results in the expansion of the lung, increasing the interthoracic volume, which results in a direct decrease in interthoracic pressure. The pressure now inside the lung is less than that outside of the body at atmospheric pressure and therefore air passively moves from outside the body to inside the body in attempt to equalize the pressures both in and outside. During the process of expiration, the signal to the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles via the phrenic nerve ceases, which results in relaxation of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. As these muscles relax, so the diaphragm moves upwards and the intercostal muscles relaxing results in a recoil of the chest back to its original size. This decrease in volume of the thorax results in an increase in interthoracic pressure. Now the pressure is higher inside the lungs than it is outside the body. So air passively flows from high pressure out to low pressure outside until there's an equalization of pressure inside and outside the body. Now, because ventilation is just the movement of air into and out of the lungs, respiration is the exchange of gases that needs to occur in order for us to oxygenate the body and to rid the body of carbon dioxide and other gases. There are two major sites of respiration. The first is called external respiration and this is the site where gases are exchanged between the pulmonary capillaries and the alveoli in the lungs. Alveoli are the only site within the respiratory system in which gaseous exchange can occur. All the structures of the respiratory system are several cells thick, so it's very difficult for gases to move readily across these membranes. However, in the alveoli, there are only one cell thick, so gases can move easily in and out of the alveoli into the surrounding capillaries. And then the site of internal respiration is anywhere where gaseous exchange occurs between the systemic capillaries and the systemic tissue cells. It's important to note that as oxygen enters into the body and into the system, that the concentration of oxygen is mixed and it decreases. So what we breathe in the air is a much higher concentration of oxygen to that which is delivered at the levels of the tissue. And to give an example, the partial pressure of oxygen in the air that we breathe is about 159 millimeters of mercury. 
This is just the concentration of oxygen in comparison to the other concentration of gases that are in the air we breathe. Once this actually is inhaled into the body, and there's mixing of gases of oxygen and carbon dioxide, the concentration of oxygen or the partial pressure of oxygen that is in the alveoli by the time we have gone through the process of inspiration has dropped from 159 millimeters of mercury down to 105 millimeters of mercury. As this oxygen then exchanges between the alveoli and the capillaries, it then decreases even more to about 100 millimeters of mercury. And what's actually delivered all the way down at the tissues is much less. So also keep in mind, if somebody is not ventilating appropriately, they're going to be getting less amounts of partial pressures of oxygen down into the alveoli, which is then going to decrease the amount of oxygen that is transported around the system to the cells and tissues, resulting in a state of hypoxia. Chest injuries are directly responsible for 25% of all traumatic deaths. In Australia, 90 to 95% of chest injuries are the result of blunt force trauma, and of that, 80% were a result of motor vehicle accidents. And knife wounds are the most common cause of penetrating trauma to the thorax. The different classifications of injury to the chest can include skeletal injuries such as clavicle fractures, rib fractures including simple rib fractures and flail chest, and sternal fractures. Pulmonary injuries such as pulmonary contusions and the pneumothoraces, injuries to the heart and the great vessels, and diaphragmatic injuries. Whenever managing a patient with either blunt or penetrating thoracic trauma, it's important to do a good focused chest examination. First starting off with inspection, so looking for equal rise and fall of the chest and also observing for any paradoxical movement where a section of the chest may be moving in opposing form to the rest of the thorax. Observe the rhythm, the rate and the depth of respirations and look for any use of accessory muscles which can indicate an increased work during ventilation. When palpating the chest, press down on the sternum and compress the lateral aspects of the ribs to assess the integrity. Feel for equal rise and fall of the chest and for equal movement and rhythm. Examine the trachea, feeling for abnormalities and any deviations and percuss the chest, listening for sounds of the chest reverberating back. The way that we perform a percussion is by splaying the fingers along the ribs, preferably with the non-dominant hand. Place your middle finger in the intercostal space or on the intercostal muscle, so between the ribs, and use your dominant hand to tap on that finger. It'll send a vibration through the chest and it'll create a sound for you to hear, which is the resonance of that object. So we're looking for what could be normal resonant, hyperresonant, or hyporesonant. This will take some time and practice to get comfortable with, and it's something that we will ensure you have lots of practice with during your face-to-face -face training. Auscultation, listening to the apexes and bases for any abnormal lung sounds. These are some of the auscultation sites that can be used. One of the biggest things to note and ensure is that whenever listening to the bases of the lungs, Try not to place your stethoscope anywhere below the xiphoid process. If you're placing your stethoscope right down on your 11th and 12th ribs, you're probably not listening to lung sounds at that point. You're most likely listening to the vibrations of the air entry through the abdominal organs. Remember your anatomy and where the diaphragm lies. In any patient that has had thoracic trauma, it's important to continue this focused chest examination every time you assess the patient's vital signs. We want to be watching very, very closely at all of these different aspects of the examination for any changes that could indicate that the patient is deteriorating. In this next section, we'll have a look at the different types of skeletal injuries, including clavicle fractures, rib fractures, flail chest, and sternal fractures. Clavicle fractures are one of the most common types of fractures and they result from blunt force trauma to the chest, usually resulting from some kind of sporting or recreational activity. 
The patient may show signs and symptoms of a fracture, showing things such as deformity, pain over the area, uh, damage to the soft tissue around the area and structures resulting in swelling. They may be protruding of the bone. The patient will generally complain of pain on the site, may be experiencing difficulty in breathing or shortness of breath because of the pain involved during inspiration and expiration. We may note that there's an asymmetry in the thorax and the patient generally will immobilize the arm on the affected side to prevent any further movement or pain. There may be a rare complication of a subclavian vein or artery laceration. However, it's important to do a careful vascular examination of the arm on the affected side. So ensure that you assess pulses on both arms, making sure you have equal strength and regularity of pulses, good capillary refill, skin temperature and color has not been compromised. If at any point you note that there's absent or diminished distal pulses, it's important to rapidly move this patient off to hospital because there could be the complication of the subclavian artery or vein laceration. Due to the nature of the apex of the lung extending roughly about 2.5 centimeters above the clavicle during inspiration, there may be the complication of a pneumothorax. The general management for clavicle fractures is to provide appropriate pain relief and immobilize the arm on the affected side. This prevents any further movement of those bones, limiting the amount of damage and pain that patient may experience. And we can immobilize the limb using either an elevation sling or a hospital sling, depending on what's the most comfortable position for the patient to be in. Rib fractures are most commonly a result of blunt force trauma. There are a few cases, however, that are related to or a result of penetrating trauma. The assessments and findings of rib fractures can range from signs and symptoms of a fracture, pain over the site, deformity, swelling, bruising, crepitations, or even bone protruding through the skin. And this type of fracture can cause quite severe pain on inspiration. Anything ranging from a single bone fracture to multiple rib fractures uh, can cause such severe pain that patients actually decrease their respiratory effort and also an ineffective cough to clear their airways. The patient generally will try to decrease how much they breathe and how deeply they breathe, so decrease their respiratory rate and tidal volume to decrease the pain that they're feeling during inspiration. This can result in shortness of breath and dyspnea, and there may be complications such as a pulmonary contusion or pneumothorax where the rib has punctured through the pleural membranes and caused damage to the lung tissue underneath. A major difference between adults and children is that children's ribs are highly more flexible and their chest wall is more compliant and due to the increased elasticity if a child undergoes the same blunt force trauma as an adult the child will have greater deformation of the chest wall before rib fractures and what this means is that we need to be highly suspicious of major internal injuries um, which can occur with or without external chest wall injuries. Management of the patient with rib fractures should include assessing your airway, breathing and circulation, doing a thorough focused chest exam and assessing the patient's vital signs. If the patient is showing any sign or symptom of hypoxia, ensure that you administer oxygen therapy Giving appropriate pain relief to these patients is absolutely necessary because if we reduce the amount of pain that they are experiencing, they will no longer be guarding the area and will generally start to ventilate very well. A flail chest is a condition whereby the ribs are broken into segments in two or more places and that occurs on two or more adjacent ribs. So if you have a look at the diagram over here, we have the first rib which is broken in two sections making a loose or flail segment and this occurs in the two ribs below. This creates then what's called a flail segment or a flail chest. A flail chest is usually a result of a significant blunt force trauma to the chest and one of the clinical signs and symptoms of this flail chest is this paradoxical 
movement or motion during inspiration and expiration shown in the diagrams on the right. During inspiration, when the thoracic wall moves out, the flail segment of the chest, because it's no longer intact or an integral part of the thoracic cage, then gets sucked into the chest by the negative pressures generated during inspiration. And the opposite happens during expiration. The chest wall generally will move or recoil back to its original position, but the high pressures that are now generated during expiration force that flail segment outwards. So we see the seesaw or paradoxical chest movement. We have a very short clip to show you on the paradoxical movement of the patient's chest in a flail chest. So you can see there's the paradoxical motion, the abrasions and contusions over the affected area. And we can note that seesaw movement of the chest and paradoxical motion to the rest of the ventilation. And this is a, a really brilliant depiction of that flail segment moving during ventilation. You can see that paradoxical seesaw motion of the chest during inspiration and expiration. Other clinical findings are the signs and symptoms of a fracture, major deformity of the chest, major bruising of the overlying tissues, discoloration, swelling, lots of crepitations due to the sound of those bones constantly moving back and forth against each other during inspiration and expiration. And the patient will be in a considerable amount of pain. There will quite often be abrasions or contusions over the site of injury. These patients will show signs and symptoms of shortness of breath and severe dyspnea. It's very, very painful for them to breathe. So they will actually try to actively reduce their tidal volume and respiratory rate to try and reduce and manage their pain. Due to the nature and the mechanism of injury of a flail chest, there is a high chance of a complication of a pulmonary contusion, so bruising of the actual lung tissue, which reduces part of that lung being able to be involved in external respiration, and the possible complication of a pneumothorax. So these three things coupled together, the patient actively reducing their tidal volume and respiratory rate, the complication of a pulmonary contusion and possible pneumothorax will lead to the patient becoming hypoxic and they could deteriorate rather rapidly if not managed appropriately. The management of a patient with a flail chest first starts with the assessment. Running through your DRS ABCD and assessing the airway, breathing and circulation. Conduct a focused chest exam. When posturing this patient during our management, if they're of a good level of consciousness, they should be seated upright with a supportive dressing or pillow or a sandbag over the affected area to try and minimize or prevent the movement of that flail segment during inspiration and expiration. If the patient, however, is unconscious, laying the patient on the injured side is very effective in splinting the area and preventing further movement and damage of the underlying tissues. However, just keep in mind that if the patient is unconscious and requires IPPV or positive pressure ventilations, that they then need to be in the supine position. These patients will require oxygen regardless of their level of consciousness. So ensure that we're giving high concentrations of high flow oxygen therapy to them. And if the patient is hypoventilating, they will require IPPV or assisted positive pressure ventilations. Providing appropriate analgesia is very important for these patients because with the appropriate analgesia on board, these patients will hopefully increase their respiratory effort, increasing their tidal volume and respiratory rate, being able to combat hypoxia. The question is, is what pain relief would you provide for this patient? So we need to have a look at what pharmacologies you have available and what would be appropriate for each individual in each circumstance. Then very important to monitor these patients closely. They are at high risk of respiratory insufficiency and respiratory arrest. We need to constantly be reevaluating the patient's ABCs, vital signs, pain score, and conducting a focused chest exam regularly, observing for any signs and symptoms of a pneumothoraces developing.
Sternal fractures are a result of a direct force to the anterior chest. This is usually a result of unrestrained persons in a car hitting the steering wheel or hitting the dashboard with their chest during a motor vehicle accident. Sometimes when airbags have not been deployed, all these kind of fractures can also be created by rapid deceleration injuries, use of seat belts and restraints, falls from a height and personal assault. Assessment and findings can include anything from the normal signs and symptoms of a fracture, obvious shortness of breath and dyspnea. This patient may be struggling to get adequate tidal volumes because of the lack of integrity in the chest wall. And there could be multiple different signs and symptoms of respiratory or cardiovascular complications. In approximately 66% of all sternal fractures, there is some kind of pulmonary or cardiac injury underlying. Management of these patients will include conducting your DRS ABCD assessment, assessing airway breathing and circulation, looking for any signs or symptoms of pulmonary or cardiac complications, assessing the vital signs, pain scores, providing oxygen therapy if the patient has a good enough tidal volume and a good enough GCS. But if the patient is unconscious, they may require positive pressure ventilations. Position this patient, if conscious, in a semi-reclined position on the stretcher, or if the patient is unconscious, they need to be placed in the supine position to aid for airway management and ventilation support. Managing the pain in a sternal fracture is also very important for their ability to ventilate appropriately. Look at the pharmacologies that you have available and rule out the contraindications of each of these and provide the appropriate one. Monitor these patients very closely. Keep watching for any signs or symptoms of development of pneumothoraces or cardiac complications and transport rapidly to hospital. In the next section, I'm going to be talking about the different types of pneumothoraces and how we assess them, the signs and symptoms that go with each type and how to manage each of the respective conditions. Pneumothoraces are a result of damage to either the visceral or the parietal pleura, resulting in air leaking into the pleural space and causing partial or full collapse of the affected lung. The pleural space can either fill with air, blood, or with both, depending on the mechanism of injury and the damage to underlying tissues. By definition, a pneumothorax is when there is air trapped in the pleural space, a hemothorax is when blood is trapped in the pleural space, or a hemoneumothorax is when blood and air is trapped in the pleural space. For the purpose of this lecture today, we're going to be focusing on the pneumothorax. The different types of pneumothorax can be divided into open or closed pneumothorax. The open pneumothorax is when there has been a penetration of the skin and air is entering the pleural space from outside the body through a hole in the chest wall and filling the pleural space. In the closed pneumothorax there has been damage to the visceral pleura and this results in air from inside the lung filling that pleural space or pleural cavity. The closed or simple pneumothorax results from a tear or opening in the visceral pleura allowing air to escape into the pleural space causing either partial or full collapse of that lung. And this can be a result of either what's called a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, which can occur spontaneously without any underlying disease, trauma or surgery. The primary spontaneous pneumothorax occurs generally more in the male sex than in females and occurs in tall thin males that are typically smokers. Whereas conditions such as the secondary spontaneous pneumothorax uh, can result from underlying medical conditions such as COPD and cystic fibrosis, tuberculosis, lung cancer and HIV associated pneumonias. Resulting from blunt force trauma, fractures are the most common cause of pneumothoraces due to the sharp edges of the fractured ribs damaging that visceral pleura and underlying lung tissue. And another cause of simple or closed pneumothorax 
is paper bag syndrome. Paper bag syndrome effectively results from rapid increasing interthoracic pressures against a closed glottis. For example, in the picture here, somebody is bracing for impact during a motor vehicle accident. They hold their breath and brace their body, so tense their body. This closes the glottis and as the chest makes impact with the steering wheel, the interthoracic pressures shoot up dramatically because of the compression of the chest. This causes barotrauma and injury to the alveoli and the visceral pleura. The assessments and findings involved in a pneumothorax may include signs and symptoms of trauma and therefore signs and symptoms of a fracture, shortness of breath or difficulty in breathing because the patient is unable to obtain a good enough tidal volume due to the fact that their one lung is being compressed by the gases in the pleural space. The patient may be experiencing hypoxia due to the ineffective tidal volume and ventilation perfusion mismatch in the affected lung. This may result in signs and symptoms of the cardiovascular system compensating, showing signs such as a tachycardia, sweating, and initially increased blood pressures. The patient would be experiencing significant pain either due to the trauma or pain due to the compression of that lung and we may find asymmetrical movement of the chest during inspiration and expiration as well as decreased air entry in the affected side. Subcutaneous emphysema can be seen in all different types of pneumothorax and is most commonly felt in the superior portion of the anterior chest up near the clavicles and the neck. Subcutaneous emphysema is a result of air actually leaking from the pleural space under the tissues such as the muscles and the skin. Whereas an open pneumothorax is always a result of trauma, it's either due to penetrating chest trauma or open or compound rib fractures. Air moves directly from outside the body into the pleural space through the hole in the chest wall and often there's an audible sound of air moving in and out of that opening in the chest. This is also known as a sucking chest wound. The assessments and findings involved in an open pneumothorax could be an obvious open wound or open fracture on the affected side, may have signs and symptoms of fracture, audible gurgling sound at the site of the injury, decreased air entry on the affected side due to the inability for that lung to expand properly during inspiration, subcutaneous emphysema like we saw in the simple pneumothorax, shortness of breath or dyspnea, hypoxia due to the ineffective ventilation, so hypoventilation and also the ventilation perfusion mismatch, the cardiovascular system compensating by causing tachycardia, sweating and an initial increase in blood pressure. The patient would be experiencing significant pain, asymmetrical movement of the chest during ventilation. When managing a pneumothorax, the management of an open or closed pneumothorax is the same. The only difference in management of the open pneumothorax is that we provide a dressing over the wound site, which I'll explain as we go through the management. Initially, we'll assess the patient, checking the DRS ABCD, so assessing airway, breathing and circulation, conduct a focused chest examination, then apply ECG monitoring and oxygen saturation monitoring. Posture this patient seated in an upright or semi-reclined position if the patient's of a good level of consciousness or if the patient is unconscious we may need to posture them in the supine position and provide positive pressure ventilations. So a question to you is would this patient require oxygenation and the answer to that should be yes. This patient is at high risk of hypoxia because of the hypoventilation that one lung is not functioning appropriately and also because of the ventilation perfusion mismatch. We need to place these patients if they are of a good level of consciousness and ventilating well on oxygen therapy and if the patient is not ventilating well and has a decreased level of consciousness we need to be providing positive pressure ventilations via bag valve mask.
For the open pneumothorax, where we have a sucking chest wound, we should apply a non-porous dressing to the wound and tape it on three of the four sides. The reason why we tape it on three of the four sides, leaving the most inferior portion of the dressing open, is so that if there is any blood or fluids from the wound, it can dribble down and we're not trapping it in. And this dressing also provides a one-way valve for that sucking chest wound. So that when the patient breathes in and there's a negative drawback on the dressing, the dressing is stuck onto the wound and the patient will not be introducing air through this opening any longer. However, when the patient is going through expiration and breathing out, air will be able to escape freely from this type of dressing. Please take special note that when using a three-way dressing or any other type of chest dressing over an open pneumothorax, you need to check this regularly that it doesn't get clotted or clogged up. You may need to change this dressing regularly to ensure that it still provides that one-way valve to the sucking chest wound. Medications could be quite tricky to administer to this patient. So a pneumothorax is contraindicated for Entonox. And depending on the patient's level of consciousness and hemodynamic status, other medications may be ruled out in this setting as well. Obtain IV access in case the need for IV therapy administration arises due to any hemodynamic instability or deterioration. Monitor the patient closely, monitoring their ABCs, vital signs, pain score, and focus chest exam, particularly watching for air entry, asymmetrical movement of the chest, and then signs or symptoms of deterioration. In the event of an open or a closed pneumothorax deteriorating, it can result in a condition called a tension pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax is when air has not been able to escape from the pleural space, but air continues to enter into the pleural space and it's now under pressure. This pressure can cause full collapsing of the lung on the affected side and it can also put tremendous amount of pressure on the surrounding structures such as the mediastinum. So the great vessels and the heart and actually result in shifting of the mediastinum. And just to confirm here that this can be due to either an open or a closed pneumothorax. So both conditions, if not relieved or managed, can result in a tension pneumothorax. In the assessment findings, depending on what caused the pneumothorax, there could be a fracture or an obvious open wound. Signs and symptoms of hypoxia, shortness of breath and difficulty in breathing, tachycardia, pain, asymmetrical chest movement, decrease to almost no air entry on the affected side, subcutaneous emphysema, and then some of the specific signs to show that a definite tensioning has occurred, such as jugular vein distension, Jugular vein distension occurs due to that mediastinal shift. It can compress the superior vena cava, resulting in a backup of blood, resulting in distension of the jugular neck veins. This mediastinal shift also causes compression of not only the superior vena cava, but also the inferior vena cava. And this causes there to be a decrease of return of blood to the heart, so a decrease in preload, which means that we have a decrease in afterload or the amount of blood that's also being ejected out of the heart. This can decrease blood pressures, cause hemodynamic instability, and result in signs of symptoms of obstructive shock. Tracheal deviation may be seen, uh, but this is a late sign. So usually by the time you see this, the patient has well and truly been in attention pneumothorax for a long period of time. They may or not, may not be conscious at this stage because of the severe hypoxia and the hemodynamic instability. I just have a short portion of a video clip to show you to demonstrate what happens when the lung is under pressure in attention pneumothorax and how it puts pressure on the surrounding structures such as the heart and the great vessels causing that mediastinal shift. And also observe the shift that occurs in the trachea as well, how the trachea deviates away from the affected lung.
and there happens the shift. So we can see from this diagram, um, the lung has collapsed uh, due to the pressure in the tension pneumothorax and it's put pressure on the heart, uh, the great vessels and the whole mediastinum causing a shift to the opposing lung and even compressing into that opposing lung. And because of the attachment into the bronchial tree here, the trachea has also been shifted away or deviated away from that affected lung. Here are some chest x-rays and CT scans of what a tension pneumothorax looks like with a mediastinal shift. So first having a look at the x-ray on the left hand side of the screen here, we can see all this dark area is all air. So that's the side of the tension pneumothorax. We can see that there's expansion of that side of the chest and the heart over here, which is usually in the center of the chest moving off to the left hand side, has now been moved with all the great vessels over to the right hand side of the chest over here and is causing compression of the lung on the right hand side. This light structure at the back over here is the vertebra, the thoracic vertebra going up. And just to show you that dark structure over there, that is the trachea that is actually shifted over, then deviated into the other side or the unaffected side of the chest. On the CT scan over here, um, we're looking up the patient's body. So they've done a cross section of the thorax. Uh, this is the left hand side of the person's thorax, the vertebra over here and the right hand side of the chest with the sternum at the top. So normally if we're looking up this and if we're looking at this view of the patient, the great vessels and the heart should be more central leading over to the left. But because of the massive pneumothorax on the right hand side of the patient's chest, it's shifted the heart and the great vessels even more so into the left hand side of the chest and is causing significant decrease in that lung's capacity to ventilate. Going along with the management that we've spoken about with the normal open and closed pneumothorax, we're going to assess the DRS ABC, so checking the airway breathing circulation, conduct a focused chest examination, apply ECG and oxygen saturation monitoring, posture the patient if they have a good level of consciousness, either seated or semi reclined on the stretcher. Um, if the patient is, however, unconscious, which might be likely, lay the patient supine and manage them from that position. This patient would most definitely require oxygen. If they're of a good level of consciousness, oxygen therapy will be adequate. Or if this patient has a decreased level of consciousness, we may need to provide positive pressure ventilations via bag valve mask. Needle decompression is a life-saving skill by which a needle is inserted into the affected side where the tension pneumothorax is and it helps to instantly relieve the pressure in the pleural space, allowing the lung to reinflate and restore circulation. The step-by-step -step procedure on how to perform a needle decompression will be discussed in the slides to follow. With regards to providing pain relief to these patients, Assess the medications that you have available and ensure that you rule out the contraindications and provide the appropriate pain relief for the individual. Obtain IV access in preparation for the need of IV therapy. Obviously, in this case, if we pump these patients full of fluid, but yet we have not relieved the tension pneumothorax, the fluid is going to be ineffective at helping to raise the person's blood pressure. They don't have a low blood pressure because of blood loss in the system necessarily, but it's more so the fact that there's an obstruction to the blood flow. So we're looking at obstructive shock. So we need to remove the obstruction for administering IV fluids. Monitor the person's airway breathing and circulation very closely, as well as the vital signs, pain score and air entry. When conducting the skill needle decompression, we need to understand that this is only indicated for a patient with a tension pneumothorax.
a simple closed pneumothorax or an open pneumothorax is not an indication for needle decompression. The patient needs to be in a tension pneumothorax in order for needle decompression to occur. The telltale signs to differentiate between a pneumothorax and a tension pneumothorax is things such as jugular vein distension, hyperresonance on the affected side, and no air entry or decreased air entry on the affected side. Decreased blood pressure, and then lastly, because it's a late sign, looking for things like tracheal deviation. But we're not waiting for tracheal deviation to occur. We only need to be looking out for these signs as well as the hemodynamic instability. Because of the nature of this skill, it is a dangerous skill that we perform, but we need to perform it because it's a life-saving skill. And if we didn't do this in the field, these patients would most likely die. So we need to understand the possible complications of this skill and be able to perform it correctly. The complications could cause damage to the costal vessels and nerves, so the intercostal arteries, veins, and nerves. We could cause a pneumothorax because we're creating an opening in the thoracic cavity. And if we have misdiagnosed this patient, we could actually cause a lot of damage to them. Incorrect placement of the needle could cause mammary, subclavian, or even cardiac damage. The equipment that's required for performing the needle decompression is an IV catheter, either size 14 gauge or 12 gauge, a syringe, saline, a one-way valve, which could comprise of a Heimlich valve or otherwise using something such as a finger cut off of a glove to create a one-way valve and some securing tape. The landmark that we use for emergency needle fluorocentesis or needle decompression is one of the safest landmarks to use in the pre-hospital setting. You may see that when doctors perform this in the in-hospital setting where they're actually inserting formal chest strains, they usually use the lateral aspects of the chest. Uh, we are not permitted to do that in the pre-hospital setting. We are only permitted to use the second intercostal space on the anterior chest on the affected side. In order to locate the exact landmark, uh, we can palpate the sternum, feeling for the sternal angle or the angle of Louis. This gives us the position where the second rib articulates with the sternum. We can move our fingers across the rib to find the location of the mid-clavicular line. Once we've found that location, we can move into the intercostal space. Because running under each rib, we have a artery, vein, and a nerve bundle. We want to make sure that we are missing that area and not causing any damage or complications to the vasculature there. We're inserting in the needle in the second intercostal space above the rib below. What that means is that we're finding the second intercostal space, but we're actually also feeling for that third rib. And when we insert the needle, we're just inserting the needle above the third rib to avoid any complications of the vasculature underneath the second rib. While preparing all your equipment to perform the needle decompression, explain the procedure to the patient and where possible gain their consent. Have the patient positioned either seating upright, leaning against the stretcher or in the semi-reclined position, or if the patient is not of a good level of consciousness, you may need to perform the skill in the supine position. Don the appropriate PPE for the procedure, so clean gloves, make sure you clean the site, and then in a 10 mil syringe, draw up a few mils of saline and attach that syringe either onto your 12 or 14 gauge needle. Locate your landmark and have your securing tape and one-way valve ready. Once all your equipment is ready to go, locate the third rib midclavicular line and aim just above that rib so that you're inserting the needle into the second intercostal space. Insert the needle at a 90 degree angle to the patient's chest, slightly angling the needle towards the spine. As you insert the needle through the skin, Start pulling a negative pressure back on the syringe. 
This will help you to recognize when you have entered into the pleural space as bubbles will be seen as you're drawing back on the syringe. When you see bubbles as you're drawing on the syringe, stop. You do not need to advance the needle any further. Advance the catheter into the chest, remove the needle and the syringe and dispose of the sharps in the sharps container. Apply a one-way valve over the catheter and secure this in place. Reassess the patient's chest afterwards to ensure that you are now getting air entry into the affected side. If needs be, you may need to conduct a second or a third needle decompression adjacent to your decompression site. We're going to show you a video of how the needle decompression works in a patient with a tension pneumothorax. This is a live video taken from inside the thoracic wall when a patient has had a tension pneumothorax and the effect that the needle thoracentesis has on that. So here we have the needle actually entering into the thorax and you can see as soon as it has the lung at the bottom end of the screen starts to expand. The needle is retracted leaving the catheter in the thoracic cavity. And here we see the lung actually starting to expand significantly and start to reinflate during ventilations. So we can see from that fantastic video how effective the needle decompression is for relieving the tension and the pressure inside the thoracic cavity and allowing for re-expansion and reinflation of that lung. Uh, we will have ample time during your face-to-face -face training to teach you and train you on how, and how to perform the needle decompression appropriately and safely. We're now going to have a look at some of the different cardiac injuries which can occur as a result of chest trauma. The first is pericardial tamponade. Pericardial tamponade is an accumulation of blood in the pericardial sac surrounding the heart. And this can either be caused due to blunt force trauma to the heart where the blood vessels around the heart bleed or because of shearing of the aorta or damage to the blood vessels leaving the heart. It can also be a result of penetrating trauma to the heart. As the blood fills within the pericardial cavity, it compresses the heart and squeezes the heart, disabling it from being able to fill effectively and contract effectively. This can lead to signs and symptoms such as cardiogenic or obstructive shock. So this is a kind of shock that's a result of pump failure, where the heart is unable to pump effectively due to the compression of the heart in the pericardial sac. This will lead to signs and symptoms such as poor perfusion, poor pulses, and the other signs and symptoms of shock. The patient may be experiencing chest pain or chest discomfort. There can be a narrowing pulse pressure because of the inability to generate a good systolic blood pressure during contraction. So as the systolic blood pressure decreases, it becomes closer and closer to the diastolic pressure. You may see signs of Bex triad, which include showing signs such as jugular vein distension, muffled heart signs, and hypotension. Dyspnea or difficulty in breathing and shortness of breath. And the patient may also show signs of pulses paradoxus, which is a decrease in systolic blood pressure by at least 10 millimeters of mercury or more during inspiration. And there could also be electrical alterations such as arrhythmias. Management of these patients include assess and manage the patient's airway breathing and circulation, apply ECG and saturations monitoring, obtain IV access as aggressive fluid replacement may be needed to increase the preload, and rapidly transport these patients to hospital. And the final type of thoracic injury we're going to be talking about is the traumatic aortic rupture. This can result from rapid deceleration injuries in motor vehicle accidents or falls from a height and accounts for about 15% of all blunt force trauma deaths. One in every six people who have died in a motor vehicle accident have died as a result of traumatic aortic ruptures. 80 to 90% of all these patients have died on scene. 
The aorta is one of the vessels in the body which is under the highest amount of pressure because it's blood that's directly leaving the heart and it transports large volumes of blood around the body as well. So any damage to the aorta can result in mass amounts of blood loss in a very short period of time. Signs and symptoms would include hypovolemic shock with no obvious signs of bleeding. We would need to be looking at mechanism of injury, so high or significant mechanisms of deceleration injuries. The patient may have different blood pressures on the left versus the right arm, depending on what portion of the aorta has been torn or sheared. The patient may also have adequate perfusion or pulses in the upper extremities, but very poor or no uh, pulses in the lower extremities, again, due to the location of where the aorta has been damaged. Management of a patient with an aortic rupture or shear involves assessing and managing the airway breathing and circulation, ECG monitoring, saturations monitoring, provide oxygenation and if necessary ventilation, obtain IV access and administer IV fluids if required, take spinal precautions due to the nature of the mechanism of injury, particularly if this is a rapid deceleration injury, and rapidly transport these patients to hospital as surgery may be required. Thank you for joining us in this online lecture on chest injuries. If you have any questions or queries regarding the content of this lecture, please don't hesitate to contact paramedical services and we look forward to seeing you in the face-to-face -face training.